As a young child, my parents opened a savings account for me. The account was in my name and I could look in the passbook. Do y'all remember passbooks? You remember back when they gave you that little book and you'd take it to the bank branch and every time you made a deposit or you wanted to see the interest, you'd hand the teller your little passbook and they would put it in the printer and it would print out the new balance and the interest and any deposits or withdrawals that are made. So I could look at the passbook. It was both mine, but not yet mine. The money in the account was there for me to use, but not then. I could see the balance growing and I could even contribute to it as I did when I got my first job, but I couldn't have full access to the funds until I turned 18. As followers of Jesus, we walk in two realities, the now and the not yet. We live in God's kingdom and his promises now, and yet we wait with hope for the full fulfillment that will come one day. Holding these two realities in tension can be difficult and frustrating at times. Can I get an amen to that? In Revelation 21, we're gonna read about the full fulfillment of God's promises. And the temptation for us is one of two things, either to live entirely in the now and forget about that which is to come, or to live entirely in the not yet and forget that God has called us to be his people who faithfully follow him now. So we wanna look at the promises of God here in Revelation in these final two chapters, see the wonderful conclusion of all of history and the great drama that has unfolded, and remember that God wants us to participate and walk in that kingdom now as we wait for its fulfillment. As we look in Revelation 21 here, Christ has reigned for a thousand years and Satan and his demons after a short release have all been cast into the lake of fire along with all those who have rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. God now restores all that was lost in the fall and he brings creation full circle back to where it started before it was ruined by sin. Aren't you ready for that day? Don't you look forward to that? As end times people, we wait and hope for Christ's return and the complete fulfillment of God's kingdom and God has called us to fully live in and embrace his kingdom now, right where we are. How do we do that? We're gonna look at five promises today in Revelation chapter 21 and see how we can walk in those promises today and wait with hope for their full fulfillment. So the first promise that God makes us in Revelation 21, we find in verses one and two, and it's this. God promises a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. A new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. Verses one and two, it says, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. One of the things that I love to do most is to spend time out in God's creation. Anybody else like to do that? Every Monday, I like to go for a run. I go down to the beach in Ventura, and I run along the path, and I love the sights, sounds, and smells of the ocean, seeing the waves crash on the shore and hearing the roar of the ocean and smelling the salt air and looking around in the beauty of God's creation. One of the most beautiful places I've visited so far, last summer we went to uh, Bryce Canyon National Park. If you have never been, I encourage you, put that on your bucket list of places to visit absolutely stunningly beautiful. But the beauty of this creation, as beautiful as it is, is a garbage can compared to the glory and the beauty of the new creation that awaits us, that God is gonna build. And as we've already seen in Revelation, this earth is gonna be pretty worn out by the time the full wrath of God has been poured out on an unbelieving world. God being God, he isn't gonna give us the worn out leftovers to live with him in. He's gonna make all things new. This new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem will literally be heaven on earth. 
The text tells us that the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven as God reestablishes all that was lost in the fall. He will bring the new Jerusalem, the center of his reign, from heaven down to earth. So how do we live in that now? Clearly this is not the new Jerusalem. We live in this promise now of a new creation by preparing ourselves for it. Remember last week when Pastor Lance talked about the Jewish wedding ceremony and how that was a picture of Christ and his bride preparing themselves for one another? Jesus said in John 14, three, I go to prepare a place for you. He is right now preparing that place for us. We live in that place now by preparing this place for him. As the bride of Christ, we wait hopefully, expectantly, and with preparation so that when he comes for us or when we die, whichever comes first, we are that spotless bride prepared for him. So we live in the now by preparing ourselves for the not yet. Second promise we see in the passage this morning is this. God promises a new fellowship with him. He promises us a new fellowship with him. Verse three, it says, and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. The greatest thing that was broken in the fall and broken by sin is the fellowship between God and humanity. We read of Adam and Eve's unbroken fellowship with God that was then broken by their sin. Both Enoch and Noah were said to have walked with God. Abraham and Moses visited with God. Moses was so affected by his visits with God that he had to put a veil over his face to cover the glory. Repeated throughout the scripture again and again as well, is here in verse three, is God's promise and his desire that we shall be his people and he would be our God. That's the promise of God that was broken in the fall. I long for the day when I will see Jesus face to face. I long for the day when I will see the one who gave his life for me face to face. And I think it'll probably only be face to face for about a second before it's face to feet bowed down before him in worship. I long for the day when I can walk with him personally, literally, bodily, with him. Honestly, it's what keeps me going some days. Titus 2.13 describes this as looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our blessed hope is that one day we will see Jesus face to face. So how do we live in that promise now? We can't see Jesus face to face now. It would be glorious if we could, but we can't. So how do we live in that promise now as we await the not yet? Colossians 1.27 tells us this, that the glorious mystery made known to us is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We can live in God's promise of unbroken fellowship with God today because Jesus lives inside of us. What is better than God with us? God in us. Yes, we long for the glory of actually seeing Jesus, to be able to touch him, to bow at his feet, but don't miss out on the glory of walking with Jesus now. Don't miss out on the glory of walking with him today, abiding in him today, dwelling in him today. Don't wait for heaven to walk with and abide in Jesus. Walk with him now, today. The third promise that we see in our text this morning is this. God promises to take away all pain and death. Can we get an amen to that? God promises to take away all pain and death, verse four, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. 
Many of us have recently experienced the pain and anguish of the death of a loved one. I know because I've walked through it with a few of you recently. Some of you are walking through that pain freshly right now. I can tell you in my almost 53 years of life, I've experienced the loss of both of my parents and two of my siblings. It's incredibly hard, it's incredibly painful. Death is a horrible, painful consequence of sin that touches all of us at some time or another. Except for those who are alive, when the rapture happens, all of us will face our own death someday. Can I tell you this is not how God intended it to be? Death was not part of God's original plan. God didn't sit down as he planned out creation and say, let me plan some death into that. Death came as a result of sin. It came as a result of rebellion against God's good order. But there will be a day when death, pain, and crying will be no more. Every tear will be wiped away except for the tears of gratitude. I sure hope that God doesn't take those tears away. Those tears of gratitude that will fall as we look back on all that God has done for us. As we bow at his feet in worship, I believe we will be overcome with emotion and those tears will fall. Those tears of joy, of happiness, of seeing our Savior face to face. Another thing all of us face in this life is the deterioration of our bodies. The aches and the pains and the illnesses that come as a result of our bodies breaking down. Those of us who are this side of 50 know what I'm talking about. And all of you who are this side of 60 or 70 will tell you, oh, the best is yet to come. (laughs) I do not receive that word from you. I'm going to be the exception. No, I'm I'm probably not. (laughs) Our bodies break down and we have pain and we have sickness, we have disease, we have illness. Again, this was not part of God's good design. This came as a result of sin. And there will be a day in eternity when all of these things will be gone. I believe when we get to heaven, our bodies are going to be like when we were 25 years old. I feel like for me, that was like the pinnacle of fitness and wellness and feeling good and healthy. Uh, So that's, I may be wrong about that, but I feel like when we get to heaven, it's gonna be, I'm gonna feel like I was 25 years old. Only I still had some aches and pains then, so those are gonna be gone. So how do we live in this promise now as we wait, as our bodies deteriorate, as we experience death here on earth? We experience this, we live in this promise now by remembering that for us as believers, the second death has no power. Yes, these physical bodies will die unless Jesus comes back before that, but we as believers live in this promise knowing that the second death has no power hold on us. See, before we came to faith in Christ, we were under an eternal death sentence. The Bible in Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is what? Death. The wages we worked for in our sinfulness, the wages that we earned and deserve are death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The great news is that Christ died in our place for our sin so that we could be made righteous. See, he died once so that we don't have to die twice. Jesus died once for all, Hebrews tells us, so that we don't have to die twice. Our physical bodies will die once, and after that, we live forever in eternity. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, known as the resurrection chapter, In verse 53, it says this, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. 
O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. We can live in this promise now as we rejoice in the reality for us as believers that death has lost its sting. Yes, it's a painful experience to experience the death of those we love. Yes, it hurts for our bodies to break down and fail, but we have a hope that reaches beyond the grave. We have a hope that extends beyond death, beyond the grave. That's why we can be steadfast and immovable in our faith. That's why we can live in that promise today as we await its full fulfillment in that day. Because Jesus is victorious over hell and death and the grave, so are we. The fourth promise we see in our text this morning, this just keeps getting gooder and gooder, doesn't it? Isn't God's word good? Oh, man. The fourth promise we see in our text this morning is this. God promises to make all things new. Verse five, then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write, for these words are true and faithful. Isn't it fun to get new things? New clothes, new furniture, a new car. Not the new car payment, mind you but a new car. When I was a kid, as much as I dreaded going back to school, you know what I loved? Going shopping for new school clothes. As I got into high school, this was the best. My mom would just hand me her credit card and give me a limit and drop me off at the mall. She'd say, okay, you got 200 bucks or 150 bucks. She'd write out a little note. My son has permission to use my credit card. Signed, Alice Branch Flower. And it was the best, going to school that first day with brand new clothes, brand new shoes, a nice new haircut, feeling like a million bucks walking through the front door. That was the best, but what happened in about three months? The hair was all grown out and shaggy looking, the shoes were scuffed and worn out, and the the clothes had holes in the knees. That, was, that which was once new is now worn out and old. Everything in our world eventually wears out. Our creation itself will wear out, and the promise that we look forward to is that one day, everything will be made new. Everything. Everything is gonna be permanently new and fresh with no decay or deterioration. See, unlike those new school clothes and those new school shoes, the new creation isn't going to wear out. There's not gonna be any acid rain or pollution or uh, decay of the creation. There's not gonna be any aches and pains or decay of our bodies. Everything will be made new and will be in a permanent ongoing state of newness. See, God isn't going to take this broken down creation and just rework it. God isn't into factory refurbished. God is into new. God is gonna make all things new. The New King James has translated this verse here as behold, I make all things new, which is a good translation, but it's not the best translation. Without getting too nerdy for you here, the Greek word for make here is the word poieo, It's an active verb. Other translations render this better as saying, behold, I am making all things new. The work of God in making all things new is active and ongoing. It's not a one-time thing. God is continually making all things new in the new creation. This is great news for us as we live in the now and wait for the not yet. Why? Because God is not waiting until the not yet to start his work of making things new. Amen? 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. 
old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. How many things have become new? All things. We can rejoice today because God has already made us new creations in Christ. The old you, they're gone. That old man, that old woman, they're gone. You are a new creation in Christ. That Greek word we just talked about a moment ago, poieo, the noun of that verb is found in Ephesians 2.10, which says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance beforehand that we should walk in them. The word workmanship is the Greek word poema. It could be more accurately translated as masterpiece or work of art. It's the word from which we get our English word poem. See, God is continually poetoing you into his poema. He's continually making you new into his work of art, into his masterpiece. More and more each day, into the image of Christ, God is forming you. Think of this. There has never been and there will never be another person exactly like you in all of creation. You are God's masterpiece. You are God's workmanship, his work of art, and he is continually making you new in Jesus. We can rejoice today because God has made us and is making us new creations in Christ that reflect his glory and his majesty. And as we await the not yet of him making all things new, we can live in the promise today as he makes us new day by day. Fifth promise we see in our text this morning is this. God promises to refresh all who thirst with the water of life. God promises to refresh all who thirst with the water of life. Verses six and seven And he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be his God, there it is again, and he shall be my son. Have you ever been really thirsty? Like so thirsty that your mouth just feels cottony and dry and your tongue is sticking to the roof of your mouth. Maybe you've gone on a hike and you didn't bring enough water and it's hot out and you are absolutely just parched and thirsty, uh, desperate for a drink. When you finally get that drink of water, do you just take it and sip it like, oh, no, what do you do with that water? You, you guzzle that down. You, you swallow that down as fast as you can because you're so thirsty. You want to get that water into your body. This world and this life can meet, make us feel parched and dry, can't it? We thirst for that day when we can drink freely from the water of life. We long for the time when our thirst is truly, fully satisfied. How do we live in this promise now? Are we just stuck being thirsty until we get to heaven? No. In John chapter four, as Jesus was speaking at the wom- to the woman at the well, he said, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into eternal life. Later in John 37, it says, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. We don't have to wait until we get to heaven to drink the living water and have our thirst satisfied. Why? Because Jesus doesn't just give us living water. He is the living water. See, he's the spring within our hearts that springs up from which the living water flows. When we have Jesus, we don't just have the water, we have the well. We have the well living within us. 
that refreshes our souls daily. Question for all of you this morning. Are you someone who is filled with living water flowing out of you, or are you a dried up spring? Does the living water of Christ flow out of you, flow out of your life on a daily basis, or are you a dried up spring? Are people refreshed and have their thirst quenched by being with you or are they dried up and withered by you? Jesus said out of our hearts will flow rivers of living water. That means that others should be refreshed by that living water flowing out of us. If they aren't, something is wrong. God has designed us in the here and now, in the now as we wait for the not yet, to be people from whom the living water of Jesus flows and brings refreshing to all those who come across us. If that's not happening in your life, that's okay. Make a change. Begin to pray that God would cause that living water to flow out of you. Begin to seek him. Begin to dive into his word, and you will find that out of you will begin to flow that life. If these promises we've just talked about aren't evident in your life now, today, it may mean one of two things. Either you're not a believer in and not a follower of Jesus yet, and if that's the case, that can change today, or you've neglected the now by focusing solely on the not yet. Don't be one of those believers who is so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Yes, we want to look with eager anticipation forward to what is to come. We want to be believers who imminently await the return of Christ. Jesus, let it be today. That would be wonderful. But as we wait, let us be people who live in the now and the promises of God for today and allow God to bring heaven to earth everywhere you set your foot. See, there's going to be a day when heaven literally comes to earth. That new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. But until then, let's commit to be people who would bring heaven to earth everywhere our footsteps. Everywhere we go, we can be an outpost of heaven to those who desperately need to know that there's hope and life in Jesus. If you don't know the Lord you can enjoy fellowship with God today. You can have the joy of knowing today that death has no sting for you. You can experience new life daily and you can be refreshed by his living water. If you're here and you've never surrendered your life to Christ, the Bible says there are two things that are required. Number one, repentance. It means to repent means to change my mind, that I'm going one direction and now I'm gonna turn and go a different direction. So I repent from my unbelief. I repent from not following Christ. I repent from not believing the gospel and I turn to follow Jesus. And the second thing is faith. So I believe in faith that Jesus died on the cross for my sins in my place and that if I would trust in his finished work on the cross for my salvation, I will be saved. Romans 10, 9 says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So if that's you this morning, if you've never surrendered to Christ, if you've never repented from your sin and believed in faith that he died for your sin, not just for sin, but for your sin in your place, you can do that today. You can walk out of here today with hope for today and hope for tomorrow.